very happy to have you with us today. And we are, uh, we are very happy to have with us Jennifer Whiteman today. Uh, so uh, we are going to have a, a conversation today. First, we will have a lecture from Jenny for 30 minutes. And uh, this will be followed by a Q&A session with you uh, joining us today. So feel free to ask your questions in the chat or in the Q&A panel. And we will ask your questions to Jenny afterwards. A bit of presentation first. So uh, Jennifer Whiteman is a PhD candidate at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, where I had the pleasure to meet her. Uh, she's also a research scientist specializing in greenhouse gas inventories and life cycle analysis of agriculture, forestry, waste, and bioenergy systems. She's also an artist and she has uh, started her art, art practice in 2002. She employs scientific tropes to incite curiosity of biological phenomena and inform an ecological reflexivity. Uh, we will be sure to share more information about her art and her work uh, after this lecture. So Jenny, it is a pleasure to have you today with us and the floor is yours. You can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, all good. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I am to be here. I think Lectures Without Borders is a wonderful idea. Um, and uh, please feel free to ask your questions. Um, I will say that this talk is, uh, in the beginning, I'm going to uh, talk about my own artwork. And then uh, later on, I'm going to talk about some past descriptions of landscape through art. Um, I'm going to present some New York State climate goals through the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act very, very briefly. Um, and then I'm going to move into uh, a much more speculative quest for future landscapes. And fundamentally, I am asking all of you out there, what is your vision for our finite world. And so uh, fundamentally, I am asking if all there ever was is all there ever will be, what, if anything, do we do for those that come after? And so to start, I wanna refer to a graph that changed my life, meaning a scientist that came before me who made this Keeling curve. I'm sure you all know this, but we all need to understand this graph fiercely. And there's two trends in this graph, right? There's this long-term increase in CO2 over time. So 1960 down here to 2010, and it's just going up. And then the second thing you need to notice in this graph is this up and down arrow, or this up and down pattern in the graph. And it's pulled out here and it's the annual cycle. And if I were in the classroom with you today, I would ask you to think about why is it higher in April? Why is the CO2 levels higher in April than in October? But I'm gonna tell you because we're zooming that all summer long, we're photosynthesizing and we're sucking out all that CO2 in the atmosphere down into the plants. So you and me and the microbes can eat canned peaches all winter long and we can respire. And that's why it's the highest at the beginning of the growing season because you, me, and everybody else has been eating all of that biomass. And what is important here is that this is the annual cycle for all of the photosynthesis every single year. And it's only this much. And you compare that much right there to the amount that we have increased our CO2 levels since just 1960. And the point is, is all that sequestration right, is being respired because we are active participants in contemporary life. And what this represents is all the historic photosynthesis that's ha happened millions of years on this planet before we even arrived here. So I'm just trying to get the gravity of the situation. This much is how much we sequester every year and respire every year on the total surface of the planet. And this is the cause of our fossil fuel consumption. So are we the first climate changers or was someone else the first climate changer? And again, if I were in the classroom, I would have a pause and you would all ask yourself who were the first climate changers. 
bacteria were the first climate changers. And I love them. This is the first diagram of bacteria in the 1600s. Um, and you can see here's the simple drawing. And notice it's an action. It's like a little cartoon. It has life. It moves. It uses energy. Um, do you think bacteria who belched large amounts of methane and oxygen that changed the environment that allowed organisms and species like ourselves, humans, to evolve, do you think bacteria had foresight that if they change their environment by increasing the temperature with methane and providing oxygen for our types of respiration systems, do you think that action would have resulted in Homo sapiens sapiens, human beings, and that those Homo sapiens sapiens would invent something like antimicrobials, something that kills them? Do you think the bacteria had foresight on how they would change the world and how that might cause change upon them? And I ask that question because really what I'm asking today is do you think humans have foresight? And so I wanna ask the question, what is a biological mind? To be a biological creature, what is it to have a mind? What is the purpose of that mind? Is it born of the earth and mindful of the earth? Are we really a logical species? Yes, we have zillions of rational, rationalities, all going in all different kinds of directions. But are we actually sentient creatures? Are we higher organisms than these microbes? Do we have foresight? Do we make logical decisions? Is our life logical? Are humans any different than these ancient bacteria? looking to explore the possibilities across the ecological zones of Earth with its incredible diversity. And so here's the questions I really want to ask of you. What goals have you set for yourself? Are they really your goals? Or are they society's goals? And is our current society well-directed? And then what does it mean to have a mind and to use it? So microbes, have a biological mind that has been around for zillions of years. And what I love about microbes is that they have a microbial reflexivity. They are life within the landscape. And I use them as a model system for exploring um, what a sustainable future might look like for humans. And I do that by making these mud paintings or microbial landscape paintings. And what it is, is um, I, follow microbes living in a finite landscape of soil, water, and sunlight, and I'll show them to you in a minute. And so what's interesting here is they live in a micro ecosystem of soil, water, and sunlight and reproduce, say, every 20 minutes. Now, we live in, on the earth, a system of soil, water, and sunlight, and we reproduce, say, every 20 years. And so I'm using this sped up micro system to think about our larger system. And I do that by using something um, invented by a Ukrainian microbiologist in the late 1800s called the Winogradsky column. Um, and it's a fun experiment. You can all Google it and do it at home. It's very simple. Um, it's basically soil, water, and you put it next to sunlight and you get all of these photosynthetic bacteria. So here's probably what the soil looked like to begin with. Here are some red bacteria, this is probably algae, but the point is these pigments are created by microbes living within the soil column. I connected that experiment, which is just a school experiment, with my first ever Rothko that I have ever seen. Mark Rothko um, was an abstract expressionist uh, who made color field paintings in the United States in the middle of the last century. And this is the piece that I saw in fourth grade. So what I did was I combined the science of the Winogradsky column with a Mark Rothko painting. And my first piece was called the Winogradsky Rothko, referencing the scientist and the artist. Um, so this was the piece that I used. This was the Mark Rothko reference. And then I built this, uh, I had built these steel and glass frames. And what you can see on the left-hand side, moving left to right, is the transformation of this frame over time. And you'll see right here, the bacteria are just starting to form at the water-mud interface. Here 
it's fully developed, and then a whole bunch of decomposition and other things happened over time. Now, also note, this was one of my first projects. And so documentation is very difficult, people. And so if you're an aspiring artist, you need to think about documentation. These are some of the images that came out of it. For example, this fluorescent orange was a dead earthworm that got squished. And I've never thought microbes could make fluorescent orange, but you can see all this pointillism, right? Kind of like Surat happening in here where all the colonies are going from a single colony or a single species into a colony and then spreading in horizontal bands. Now in this piece, I had a tragic moment because I had this section, right? It's, it happened right here in the mud water interface. And I had pinks and purples and silvers and blues and greens and browns and yellows. It was so gorgeous. But I also had reproducing uh, snails. And what you can see here, are lots of snail poop and snails eating up these beautiful things, right? There was so much change and I was upset, but change is everywhere all the time. And so as I was trying to think about what was happening in the change of my mud paintings, I started looking at tra traditional landscape paintings including the Hudson River School of Art, which is a school of art that happened in the Americas in the mid 1800s. And they were landscape painters, plain air painters. Famous names are Thomas Cole, Friedrich Church, Albert Bierstadt, Asher Derlin, George and Ness. And they made paintings like this, right? Where you have the sense of majesty, majesty in, in the quote unquote new world, a sense of terror or scariness of all of the untamed nature. You'll see here the sense of conquest, right? Look, these are the redbacks. Why are they here? Look at the relationship of the number of people to the volume or area of natural resources. Why was everybody so excited to conquer the new land? Because of all of these resources. Then you see pictures like this, prospecting, right? There's only one house in the landscape. And this man is standing there with his pole, looking out on, on the adventure of possibility. And then you see these kinds of pictures where the left-hand side is tempestuous, indicating this past notion of fear of the landscape. But the right-hand side is becoming pasture and places to grow food. So that you get these smaller scale paintings where it feels manageable, like a pleasant walk through the woods, like we all know these days or pictures like this that are nature that is civilized and bucolic, right? You have a series of homes, you have a network of people, you have a colony. And then pictures like this by George Ness at Lackawanna Valley in Pennsylvania. This picture was painted in 1856. I point these out, 1856, you see a train, you see a train station, and in the foreground, you see all of these trees cut down. This is documenting how the Hudson River School of Art is showing three themes in America in the 19th century, a sense of discovery, exploration, and settlement, covering diabolical fear of nature, heavenly admiration of nature, coexistence with nature, utility of nature, and mastery of nature. What I wanna remind us all is that we have the same landscape that they had back in the 1800s. We have the exact same earth. So which variables have changed? I would argue that we are the major variable that has changed. Look at all this time on the bottom of this chart. And in the 1800s, this is before these paintings were done, right? There were 1 billion people on the planet. My parents were born in 31 and 1937 when there were 2 billion people. I was born in 1973 when there were 4 billion people. We now live with almost 8 billion people on the planet. So in this context, what is changing? We are changing. And then what are we choosing to sustain as we discuss sustainability? Now those paintings were done in about this time period. And you'll see in this graph of energy consumption that most of the energy consumption was wood products. Now you can look at all of this energy increased consumption. But what we need to do is we need to add up all of these things on the chart 
to recognize just how gigantic the amount of energy we, a contemporary society, is currently using. And when you add up all of those fossil fuels that were discovered in the late 1800s, and you think about what it's doing to our atmosphere, you come back to this chart of CO2 emissions, which then has an impact on temperature. And what I'm trying to point out here is that in my opinion, graphs are contemporary conceptual landscapes. It's a way of thinking about a manifestation of time and place and a way of thinking about the same finite materials on our planet, just differently allocated, right? All of that CO2 in the atmosphere was buried in the earth. Where was it before it was buried in the earth? It was in the atmosphere, right? So things have changed. I'm gonna skip this one. What I love about my microbes is that they are simultaneously a figure in the landscape, which is an artistic trope, and they're catalytic agents in their ecosystem. And what is so fascinating about them is that these living organisms are manufacturing the pigment in my paintings are simultaneously the subject and the substance of their painterly objectification. They're both the object and the medium. They're both the work of art and the working of autopoiesis or self-making. The color field image in my mud paintings, unlike a Rothko, is literal. What it is and it's becoming is what it means. The microbes never stop. They don't talk about scarcity. They don't talk about sustainability. One microbe's waste is another microbe's resource. Their lives change, but the livingness doesn't stop. These paintings last forever, but are never the same. And that's because if you look at this diagram of a Winogradsky column, right? You have these horizontal bands of different species of different colors, right? And you have an oxygen, high oxygen at the top, and high sulfur at the bottom, which is how these columns work and I'm not gonna talk about today. You'll see, I want you to focus on this part over here, which is the metabolic niches, right? So these cyanobacteria, they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they make a complex carbon molecule, CH2O. This heterotrophic bacteria, they take the CH2O and turn it into CO2, right? One organism's waste or one organism's waste product is another organism's resource. And that is how my dynamic mud paintings go around and around and around. And you have infinite life in a finite landscape of soil, water, and us. Uh, soil, water, and sun. These are living landscapes. I'm gonna now quickly go through some of my paintings. I've done them in the most pristine places and some of the most polluted places in the world, including the Gowanus Canal in New York City, which is a Superfund site. That Superfund is a designation for a site so contaminated of a locality that the federal government comes in to the state and the city and mandates that it be cleaned up. So, Gowanus Canal is one of our toxic treasures in New York City. Uh, this is me collecting the mud and putting it in one of the steel and glass frames I, I built. And here it is after three months. You can sort of see the originating mud color down over here. And all the other colors that you see in here are from pigmented bacteria living in the mud. I did this for three different uh, super fun sites in New York City. This is, um, uh, a super fun site that has an oil spill bigger than Exxon Valdez, which was a big oil spill back in my childhood. Um, and when I picked out that mud, it smelled like oil. And this is the Hudson River, a very famous river where the Hudson um, River painters all painted along. This has a super fun site of contamination of PCBs, uh, a very important toxin. I then turned the Gowanus Canal into a drop dead toxic dress that was uh, featured in a fashion show, right? There's all different ways that you can take these narratives and run with them. Here I am collecting rivers from uh, samples from the East River where we have uh, combined sewage overflow events. This is um, someone working on the Billion Oyster Project. And so I put some oysters 
in my East River um, painting. Um, and here it is starting. This has a bunch of seaweed um, and some eggs. And here it is after three months. Those are the pigments of the bacteria. I collected from Dead Horse Bay, which is an exposed landfill. Um, that sounds like tinkling bells because all the glass bottles are hitting each other on, in the water as the tides come in and out. And this is the mud painting that came from that piece. This is me collecting mud from the Hudson River. And I will say I got stuck out here. If you go collecting mud, the point of the slide is make sure you go with friends and you have a way of getting up because I went in deeper than my knees. And when you can't bend your knees, you are stuck. So please be careful when you're out there collecting your mud. Here is the painting from that. I went out with the River Keeper, which is a citizen watchdog, to collect mud in Newtown Creek, the space that I was telling you that had the oil spill bigger than Exxon Valdez. I just want to tell you this watchdog goes up and down our river looking for active polluters. And they're a neat organization to help keep um, organizations accountable to their impact on the environment. And this is that painting. And what I loved about this one is that uh, it has pink. I've never really thought about pastel pink as microbes. I don't know, just a silly aside. But like that, I also have been to places like Sioux Law Model Forest in Akron, New York, which is uh, protect a forest that is protecting our watershed and I installed a piece there. I was commissioned to do a piece in New York City Park by New York City Parks. And so this was a contemplation of the micro landscape and here was framing the Manhattan skyline. Um, if you saw the video, these are some images from Chestertown, Maryland. Um, and this is a time lapse over time and these are some of those images. So sort of to wrap up on this, I just wanna use a Gertrude Stein quote, which to me is quite beautiful in her essay called Composition as Explanation. The using everything brings us to composition and to this composition, a continuous present and using everything and beginning again. She wrote that in 1925. I'm gonna skip this. The point here is, when does perception, our ability to sense the world, recognize the source of our material conception? And what I'm trying to get us to arrive at is a sense of material empathy. Like when you think of a piece of plastic that is surrounding your crackers that you eat today, right? Do you think about the liveliness of the dinosaur or the ancient plant that went into making that plastic wrapper? Do you think about all of the people who had to harvest that fossil fuel and transport that fossil fuel and process that fossil fuel into that plastic wrapper so that you can eat that crack? And when you discard that plastic wrapper because you don't want it anymore, do you think about its liveliness going forward to future generations? That's what I mean by material empathy. How can we think about all of these resources that we access and acquire and use every day and think about the meaning and in import and respect those resources in the way that we try to respect each other. If the world is finite, what could we ever call waste? Why would you ever call anything waste on our finite planet? It is a resource. It has an integrity, just like you and I have an integrity. So, how are we living within our finite landscape? I'm gonna start the next section with my first piece of art I ever made when I was having an existential crisis. Almost all of my art is made out of an existential crisis. And in fact, if you're not having an existential crisis in the world, we need to think harder because I think it's actually the way that helps readjust and reinfect our way of thinking forward into the world. So I was writing my master's thesis on cancer cell biology. I was using lots of paper. There was a wild windstorm that filled a bunch of basswood trees on my friend's property, Andy Doyle. And I had just learned about a book called Art Ecological Footprint, 1996. I made my first art installation called CERD, and it was three ways of seeing, this is the book, three ways of seeing the same natural resource. 
I marked 500 square meters that would be required to sustainably produce this stack of paper, which was the average paper consumption of a Cornell student, with 500 square meters of the tree stump, so that you could see the presence of the trees, the presence of the paper, and the absence or the equivalent absence of the trees required to sustain my stack of paper. So that was the first, right? 500 square meters in order for my paper consumption. And what I'm asking us here is how many meters, square meters, do we each lease on this planet in order to have all of those natural resources that are growing on the surface, right? I'm not talking about the fossil fuel resources. I'm talking about the surface resources. So right now I'm telling you in this estimation, 500 square meters I'm leasing for my paper consumption. I also have an apartment in Bronx, New York. Now I live in a seven story building and I have 700 square foot apartment, which is basically um, 65 square meters, but we're seven stories high. So I, my apartment takes up 10 square meters. So now let's add in how many meters I am leasing just for my home. And that's 10 square meters. My point here is every object I purchase comes from some leased area of the earth. So right, 500 square meters for my paper factory, 10 square meters for my home. So now look at my state. This is the forest in New York state. All the green areas is where there's forest. All right, we're about 60, 65% forested in New York state. Back before uh, the Europeans came to the Americas, um, most of New York state was forest, but we needed to farm. And so most of the forest became farmed. So in the beginning, we were mostly forested, but by 1880, remember those paintings I showed you um, from the Hudson River School, New York State peaked at about 80% farmland. We cut our forest to build our homes, to heat our homes, to clear the land to grow our food, to clear the land to grow food for our horse transportation, right? We need to grow hay. Today, we're 60% forest. Is that because New Yorkers like forests more than agriculture? Or because we like forest songbirds better than field songbirds? Or because New York has great forest policies or because we're great environmentalists? No, I don't think so. It's because we discovered fossil fuels. And in fact, in 1825, before those paintings I showed you at the beginning, we discovered our first natural gas line. And to note, we used to hollow out logs and transport our fuel through hollowed out logs. Scary, totally scary. Our forests grew back because we had discovered fossilized forests. I return to this image. All of these resources, right, are fossilized carbon from life forms that lived a long time ago. And we use those fossils in order to sustain our 8 billion people. It's the same landscape, it's a different manifestation of matter. All there ever was is all there ever will be. The position or placement of that stuff could be in the atmosphere or buried in the ground, could be in a landfill, could be dioxin in the atmosphere. It's all one big operating system and it's just moving around in different forms. We can call it waste, we can call it toxic, or we can call it our same finite landscape and we can make better decisions. So now I wanna talk about some decisions. Friedrich Church, one of the landscape painters who was famous in the 1800s for making Hudson River School paintings of bucolic landscapes, switched from painting landscapes to landscape architecturing outside of his house. This is his house on the top of the hill and he decided outside of his picture window that he wanted to change the landscape. So instead of painting the landscape, he transformed the landscape outside of his picture window, right? We can change the landscape. We don't have to paint it. And in fact, that's what we do all the time. Today's atmosphere CO2 levels, we're at 420 parts per million. Let's talk about that fossilized carbon. 500 million years ago, the atmosphere had 2,000 to 8,000 parts per million CO2. We're only talking about 400 parts per million today. 
There was a burst of life, organisms, exciting creatures, just like you and I, trilobites, fish, corals, snails, tetrapods, ferns, so much life, so much carbon sequestration. You're struggling with a COVID shutdown. Think about all that carbon trapped in fossil fuel, just begging to get back up into the carbon cycle at the surface of the planet where it used to live. Let it be free, let it join the carbon so you and I can enjoy it as a peach, right? So here is um, an estimate of the change in carbon dioxide over long periods of time, right? We're talking millions of years ago. And this is where some scientists estimate these large amounts of 2,000 to 8,000 parts per million. Now you'll notice what happens down here. This is when all that life happened and it sucked that carbon dioxide down into all those organisms. And then they got buried. And that is our source of fossil fuel. So if we start using all this up, what do we get? We get that same CO2 that was native to planet Earth that got sucked into fossil fuels, gets released back out. Example number three, creation 2.0. Do it yourself, right? This is from a paper in Nature in 2020 showing that human-made mass exceeds all living biomass. That means we've got eight gigatons of plastic and four gigatons of animals. We've got 1. Point, well, 1,000 gigatons of building structures and about 1,000 uh, gigatons of trees and shrubs. We are a force of nature. And I'm gonna show you something near my childhood home. My whole life, I had to drive to a town called Leviton in order to get my groceries and to get my toothpaste and to get my tape and my pencils and my paper. And I would drive by what used to be a mountain on the right-hand side here. This mountain is almost entirely flat because we use it for all kinds of purposes. On the other side was a valley that has been filled in as a landfill. We are making the planet smooth, right? We're chopping down our mountains. We're filling up our valleys with landfill. And I just want to refer to a, a science fiction uh, essay by David Brin Earth from 1990. It might have been predictable, and yet few saw the answer coming. In a later day of harder times of short resources and mandatory recycling, it was inevitable that these landfills should draw the eyes of investors looking for ways to get rich because people, what is in those landfills is not waste. It's immense natural resources. We're just an incredibly lazy species. Again, the same finite materials on earth, just differently located. Quickly, for New York context, this is a chart of all of our emissions in New York State. 206 million metric tons of emissions um, every year. And they come from these different uh, sources. We're all familiar. 173 million of them, oops. 173 million come from burning fossil fuels. Remember, those dinosaurs are just yearning to be free. So every time you put gas in your car, just know that those dinosaurs are so happy they're letting you back out of the box. So what is New York doing about it? In 2019, they passed an unprecedented uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act called the CLCPA. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but it's a 40% reduction in greenhouse gases in New York State by 2030 and an 85% reduction by 2050. They have a range of ways that they're starting to do this. But what I wanna get us back to is that included in that range of ways are things like solar panels and biofuels. And so that gets us back to the land. If we think about in 1880, 80% of the forest, uh, the land was agriculture and today it's 62% forest. That's fantastic because we're sequestering all that carbon in the forest. That is a good outcome in all of this. But of the 30 million acres in New York state, 7 million are ag land and 18 million are forest land. What do we do with it? How do we consider managing this for the next generation? Um, 
I've also done a calculation here on how many acres of ag land per person. So that's 1,416 square meters to get back to our original idea of food production in New York State. So how many think that you are actively landscaping the earth with each and every purchase you make each and every day that we are all unwitting landscape architects? What if we became witty landscape architects? What if we had vision for what the future landscape looked like? Might Manhattan look something like this? I don't know. Did those that came before plan for us? Did they have enough information? Could they see graphs the way we can see graphs of contemporary life? Could they have planned? And what is our responsibility for thinking for those that come after us? The rest of the talk is pure speculation and is meant to be fun. I'm asking whatever shall we do? Of the 7 million acres of ag land in New York State or the 20 million acres of forest land in New York State, could we reduce food imports? Because in fact, this is a graph of all of the food transportation in the United States and we are a big country. Lots of food flows, right? We could grow some more of our own food. Um, I'm gonna go fast. This is our agricultural land. I showed you the forest land before, but this is a map of our agricultural land. Look at all of that agricultural land. Do we grow as much food as possible? Do we become a vegetarian or go paleo? Do we mandate small farms instead of large farms? Do we have dairies, have high-tech systems? Do we move to sheep or goats that graze across the landscape? Do we instead harvest the deer as food and improve the forest health from deer browsing? Do we have compost heated greenhouses for winter tomatoes so we don't have to import them from all the way 3,000 miles across the country from California? Do we grow high protein insects and eat those instead as many livestock? Do we return to canning our own seasonal food? Do we invest in soil robo robots to maximize the amount of food grown per acre? What do we New Yorkers do with a short growing season and very long cold winters? Do we just keep importing from the Midwest and California? Or do we do high tech things like soil worms? Do we change our diet and whose diet? Do we change the diet of the cows? Do we change our own diet? Do we change the diet of our food waste? Because 31% of our food is wasted. If we cut that in half, think of how many acres we would free up to do all different kinds of things. This looks like a delicious, delicious insect dessert. Carbon storage. Do we grow as many trees as possible and do we leave them there or do we cut them down or do we think about future generations? Do we turn it into biochar and apply that biochar to our land? Do we burn them and compress them as combusted CO2 compressed into our, our old oil wells? Do we chain them together and bury them at the bottom of anaerobic lakes where they don't decompose and future generations have large diameter, beautiful logwoods in order to make beautiful furniture? Do we displace fossil fuels with biogenic carbon, meaning things that were grown contemporarily? Do we maximize the biomass and burn it? Or do we displace as much fossil fuel as we can? Do we grow short rotation willows, switchgrass, reed canary grass, grow poplar trees, grow forests and harvest them quickly? Or do we leave them? Do we displace fossil fuels with wind and solar? This is a wind map in New York State. This is a solar map in New York State. Red means really good solar opportunity. Yellow means not so much. Germany is the poster child for solar. Germany is mostly yellow. Right? New York has a great opportunity to engage solar if Germany is doing it already. And look at this, right? Look at how the solar is filling up the landscape. It looks just like a lake. We have to think about the surface of the land because the sun that fed all of those fossil fuels is the sun that is going to feed our contemporary living landscape of energy resources. So, do we put these solar panels on prime agricultural land? I'm gonna go fast. Can we eat electrons? It is a good question. Or do we do something like agrivoltaics, right? 
this is an option. If an average New Yorker is current energy electricity only, um, I estimate, this is a rough calculation, that I need 22 square meters of solar panels, right? So now I'm adding that into my, my least land use. Do we hyper insulate our homes so that we have low energy, low carbon homes? Do we densify the human population? If we all lived in cities, we could maybe get rid of 240,000 miles of roads. And what could we do with all of that? If we convert those miles of roads into acres, we'd have almost a million acres of roadway that we could do something else with. Could we make pathways going north and south that those highways, these are highways in the United States, that become animal highways for them to migrate as the climate changes north and south? Or you could look at this art inter intervention in Ohio where people take back the highways and they plan what to do with this highway. My point here is that we're all leasing the land. And this is a brief summary of just a few components that I currently am using more than 2000 square meters. And I haven't even talked to you about the meters for my home heat or my transportation fuel, which are very huge components. So let's get back to thinking about the land that supports all of it. Um, in the 1800s, there were 17 million people in the US. Now there are 19, uh, in New York state, there are 19 million people, right? So just to give you a sense of scale, New York is the same population as the US in the 1800s. And these are our per capita consumption, uh, 15 tons per person in the US versus New York City or New York State, which is 8.8 .8 tons. In Denmark, it's 5.5 tons. And in Colombia, it's 1.5 tons. I, Jenny Whiteman, emit 10 times more than a person in Colombia. But I, Jenny Whiteman, as a New Yorker, emit half of what the average US citizen emits. As a New Yorker, I emit 50% more than a person in Denmark. But New York State is 20 million people, whereas Denmark is 5 million people. So I have more political power to affect change in my state. My state is four times larger than the whole country of Denmark, and we can do things. So I no longer care about the Anthropocene. And why is that? Because by living, naturally, we change things. That's just what happens. So I'm asking us, let's change things. What do you really want, really and truly? What do you really want? And have you really asked yourself, what do you really want? Because none of us asks each other that question. And that question is the most important question. We get fed all kinds of things that we are supposed to want, but what do you really want? And what is your vision? How do you want to think about 2050 in mind? How can you think forward to the generations that come after? Now that we have these tools of graphs and data and knowledge and communication, what is your vision for 2050 for your children and your grandchildren and for squirrels and their grandchildren? and for microbes and their grandchildren. Do you agree in a mass balanced world, all there ever was is all there ever will be? And if so, what do you want to see with the what is? What do you want to shape for those that come after? In this great chain of causes and effects, no single fact can be considered in isolation. Thank you. Questions? To note, these are my parents in front of a population chart, and they're pointing to the year that I was conceived in. Right? Thank you very much, Jenny. This was a fascinating talk. You went through a lot in there, and uh, it's really inspiring to see um, to see your journey as an artist, as a scientist, and and this perspective that you have that everything changes and everything is also the same in a way. Um, and regarding that, we have a, a question from Pavlik 
who's a student who's been attending the talk, is asking, is saying, I have an idea, we need to send carbon dioxide to space. So regarding what you were saying about, about the cycle of dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide, what do you think of that idea? And what can you, can you tell to public? Okay, so my first question is, how do you send it to space? How much energy does it take to send it to space? And if it takes a lot of energy to send it to space, which I think it might, how much energy CO2 are you left on planet Earth as a result of sending that energy to space? We have to think about life cycles in this. And then the next important thing that I think is very important is why do you see CO2 as a problem? CO2 is the basis of everything you love. CO2 is what feeds trees so that the trees can feed you oxygen. CO2 is what makes the sugars in peaches and I happen to love peaches. So sending that natural resource to outer space is like robbing future generations simply because you can't manage your CO2 today. So yes, we could try to send it to outer space or we could try to live within the cycles of the carbon cycle as opposed to sending it outer space. I don't know. What do you think? The answer is that uh, I love peaches too. I agree. <laughs> Saying in the chat, yes, yeah. It, it's all about perspective, right? It's about how we frame things. Um, and so, about framing things, one of the attendees is asking, "What do you think artists, writers, painters, and others shall and can do to help our uh, our uh, struggle for?" Uh, global ecology, um, is there any chance of collaborating with scientists and what shall youth and teachers do? Okay, so I have to say that I personally think it's a very exciting moment for art and science to come back together, right? There was a time when art and science was never separated. Um, and then we went through this period of reductionism that separated science from the art and everything else. And I think it's coming back together. And I think the next generation is going to have a very exciting moment for art and science to come back together. And there are all kinds of new residencies, art residencies or science residencies that are coming up that support both artists and scientists coming together to do all kinds of thinking together. So um, <clears throat> I think it's a, a wonderful new field and a wonderful new opportunity. And I think everybody has, everyone who's curious about the world inevitably has an interesting thing to say about it, whether or not you're a scientist or a lawyer or an artist or a teacher, right? It, it, it's about engaging our observation and then using your skill set to bring that observation to the perceptual field of all of your peers and friends, right? Like, that's why we communicate. And what would you say, uh, so, is there a point in measuring, because I'm a scientist and I like to measure things. So is there a point in measuring the impact of such things, the impact, like, did you measure the impact of your work? Like all the, the art uh, uh, exhibitions that you had, all the, the frames that you put in different places, uh, the, the very impactful one, the first one you did also with those kind of trees uh, on the campus. Did you, did you measure any of this impact and, and does it matter to you? Uh, <laughs> I would love to measure the impact, but it's, I've done almost all of my art recreationally and there's just no time to evaluate it. And also it's a bit subjective. I just have hope because uh, many people impacted me with 15 minute conversations throughout my life. And I, and I know that those idea vectors that people have shared with me have, have informed me. So I'm hopeful that my art practice um, it becomes an idea factor that helps other people think forward. Okay. Um, so another attendee is asking what passion in your life came first? Is it the arts or is it science? And how do you combine these two directions apart from today's lecture? <laughs> so uh, I came from a blue collar family uh, and my dad was a carpenter and my mom uh, was a teacher, nurse, and also an artist. And um, I became a scientist uh, because I could make a living as a scientist. Uh, uh, 
And I love science. I will always love science. I will always be a scientist because I love measuring and, and, and interpreting that and trying to understand the world. But at some point in my science practice, I also became sad or jaded or confused because the way we communicate science lost the, the levity and the wonder that I started becoming a scientist for. That is a terrible sentence, don't use it. Um, and so I started making art. And I'd actually applied to go to college to do a dual major of art and science, but I went to a tech school where I had five non-science courses. Um, so that dream didn't happen. And so it happened basically, I would say in my late twenties, uh, when I started having enough disposable income from my science research to be able to start making the art as my, as my side project. So, however, I am going back to school now to try to get a degree in art so that maybe I can spend more time on it. That's my long-winded answer. I will say, don't go into art if you want to make a living. You will suffer. Uh, I will say, make art that is free of money and the money system so that you can make art that expresses what you truly want it to express. And, and so I am not someone who advocates an art career because I think it is a tragic landscape out there. In the future, I think it should get better, but uh, at least the United States do not become an artist <laughs> as, as a moneymaker. <laughs> Thanks for this honest uh, answer. Um, so I'm looking at the chat right now, the audience, do you have any other questions for Jenny? Anything else you would like to add? So I see that we have a comment uh, from our speaker who said that uh, we could send uh, CO2 to space. And since you asked about the space rockets, they're saying that uh, we could use, we could have space rockets with generators uh, that emit energy from the heat that gives the space rockets. Um, I'm a bit confused by this answer, but regarding what Jenny said, anyway, CO2 we agreed was pretty good and we wanted to keep it on earth, right? So let's keep it that way. I do have another question for you, Jenny. Uh, if the chat has any other questions, please ask them. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the Hudson River School of Art uh, when you started uh, uh, this conversation about what we, how we think about our landscape. And would you say that um, it's the, like, is it the same today? What would you say, how much has it changed since that time in terms of, of uh, producing uh, art and creating art? I'm not sure I understand your question. Like the Hudson River School of Art? Yeah, so you mentioned that uh, a lot of these, these um, paintings had a sense of fear of nature, a sense of like, need to control things and need uh, to to see nature as resources and this so basically this this idea that nature and culture were very different things and that we had a clear divide separation between the two would you say that this is something that is still uh like uh in the majority of the, the art creation you could see today or have we changed from that view Okay, so I, I feel like I underrepresented some of those painters because okay. many of them painted uh, majestic, majestic landscapes, like spiritually, like, I don't know, just dynamic and, and, and gorgeous and un, unadulterated, like just beautiful, beautiful paintings. And what I was trying to point out was the paintings illustrate a tension between sort of this recognition of this quote unquote untouched landscape in comparison to all of these natural resources that could be acquired. And so I think in the 1800s, there was a real discourse um, between how should we treat this now that we, we have access to it. And I think yeah. actually that very much informed the United States psyche of you know wilderness acts and, and natural landscape conservation. So I, I definitely feel that there's, there's a heritage in that um, that is 
uh, novel, but I would say, uh, I would say that today, um, everybody only talks really about the economy and everything else, human labor, landscapes, everything else just gets fed into the economy. And, and in that sense, I would say that we are not really regarding the people in the landscape or the landscape. We are seemingly stuck on the economy. And what is the economy, right? It, it has the root word eco, uh, which is ecology and economy. And it, it, it comes from this idea of the home and how do we make the home? And the home is made of the people, of the landscape and of the activities. And unfortunately, I feel like um, we have sort of forgotten the ecology of our home and we have mm -hmm. moved for the economy of our home, not understanding that the economy is implicitly based on the ecology. And so right. I feel like we need to return to that. Mm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, all right, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I know Jenny covered a lot during our presentation. Um, so thank you for uh, attending and asking your very interesting questions to Jenny. Uh, you will be able to follow the, the recordings on our YouTube channel. So if you have any questions about the, the slides, because there was a lot of information in there, you can just pause it and look at the slides a bit more precisely. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Jenny, for being with us today. This was uh, fascinating and very inspiring. And um, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.